Well, welcome. I'd just like to share a couple of very interesting papers I've been looking at. And we're always learning new things about this virus. It's a novel coronavirus. So I suppose it's not surprising because it is a new virus. Now, this first paper is from the Ear, Nose and Throat Society of the United Kingdom, the Society of Ear, Nose and Throat uh, Medical Specialists. So a very prestigious uh, national organisation. Now, it's been known for some time that loss of smell, which is called anosmia, anosmia is loss of smell. Loss of smell can be a symptom of various viral respiratory infections. In fact, about 40% of cases are of anosmia, people that lose the sense of smell, is actually caused by viral infections. So it's been noted in various countries that maybe 30 to 50% of patients with COVID-19 lose their sense of smell. We believe for a period of time, although that's not quite clear yet. So it's a, it's a common symptom as it is in other viral infections. But what is interesting, and I first actually heard this about six weeks ago from an email from Iran, but I didn't report it because I had no way of validating it, but it does seem to have been substantiated by the Ear, Nose and Throat Society. It's the potential for COVID-19 to present with anosmia. To present with anosmia. So what this is saying is in a minority of cases, the first presenting features can be loss of smell. And of course, when we lose our smell, because smell is such an important part of taste, we think we've lost our sense of taste as well. So the two do kind of go together, although technically the anosmia is just the smell. So that's interesting. Now, what the ENT people are saying is that sometimes they treat this with uh, steroids. So they're advising their ENT doctors not to treat it with oral steroids. Drugs like prednisolone because um, that can exacerbate the infection. So we would advise against the use of oral steroids in the treatment of new onset anosmia during the pandemic. So that's fair enough, and that, that, that concerns specialist doctors rather than, rather than you and me. But the, the other thing that they pointed out was that if people can present with anosmia, and in some patients this is the only clinical feature they have, then that is not going to make them feel ill or think they need to self-isolate. So this is the key message that these ENT uh, doctors are telling us. That if someone has um, uh, an acute loss of the sense of smell, this anosmia, then it's reasonable to consider the real probability, or certainly strong possibility, that that is caused by the COVID-19 coronavirus infection. And of course, that means that these people should self-isolate for at least a week. So that's interesting. So that's from... Um, the uh, the people in charge of the British ENT Society and um, obviously I'll post the, the 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 website there. Now the second paper that came to my attention is another fascinating one, and again it's an audit paper from the UK. Now this is a uh, ICNARC. Uh, ICNARC is the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre. So uh, when I was on intensive care, you could spend quite a lot of time filling out uh, ICNARC forms. I don't think I ever knew what, the, what it stood for in those days, but this Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre. So of all the people that come into intensive care units in the UK, data is collected and that allows us people to learn a lot about what's going on in intensive care. So um, again, quite good source of, source of data. And again, of course, I'll post the, the link to that. Now, what this audit has done is they have reviewed the first 196 patients in the United Kingdom to be admitted to the intensive care unit. So as of probably yesterday or even today when this was published, um, 196 patients had been admitted for critical care in the United Kingdom as a result of COVID-19 infection. So they determined some of their characteristics. Now the first characteristic they determined was age and the mean age was 63. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that that was the mean age of the people suffering from severe complications because some patients would not be selected for intensive care because we only want to select patients for intensive care, which is a fairly rigorous process, to be fair. We only want to select patients from this if they're going to benefit from it. So it may have been decided that some older patients didn't benefit from it. So I'm not putting too much emphasis on that age. But what this paper did note that was concerning, 
and I know this to be the case, um, that there are some cases of younger, fitter people with no pre-existing comorbidities, no pre-existing diseases, who for some reason have developed really quite severe um, COVID-19 disease up to the point where they require critical care. Now, we looked at the, the age distribution yesterday and it was clear that the risk of severe complications goes up with age, but it can't be discounted in younger people. So that's quite important to remember. We can't discount it. We always have to observe everyone who may have this infection to monitor their clinical condition or have some way of monitoring their clinical condition. Now, of the 196 patients, they monitored, monitored them, this data for the first 24 hours in the intensive care unit. And uh, in that first 24 hours, 16 patients died and 17 patients were discharged from the uh, intensive care unit. And at the end of the 24 hours, 163 of the 196 were still in intensive care, which is by no means surprising. It looks like quite a prolonged stretch in intensive care might be necessary to treat the respiratory and cardiovascular complications of, of this COVID-19 disease. Now, this is very interesting and it's consistent with data from other places. So um, the number requiring mechanical ventilation was 175. So that's 175, 196. That wasn't the well, that is interesting, of course. But uh, so the, the rest presumably required, say, high flow oxygen and things like that. But what I was going to say that's really interesting is of this 196 patients. So it's 196 patients. Uh, 57 of them were female and 139 were male. So this is this is interesting. Interesting. So the number of the percentage of females admitted from from this is the whole pop. So you take the whole population who have developed COVID-19 and you need to go to hospital. These are the ones that required critical care and the ones that were bad enough to require critical care. 30% of them were female and 70% of them were male, 29.1 and 70.9. So more males than females getting severe disease by um, a fair margin, it has to be said. That's a significant number. Men more likely to get severe disease than women. And I don't know why this is. Some people say it's because men have got more history of alcohol drinking and smoking. They, that, that may well be the case. Um, but really, it's not clear. But it is consistent with accumulative data from other places like China and Italy that we did look at yesterday. This is WHO data. Um, so the case fatality rate is 1.7% in uh, women. And uh, that's the female figure. And 2.8% in men. So the case fatality rate is the percentage of people that die who contract the infection. So of all the data collected so far, for every 100 people diagnosed, that's been the, uh, the death rate amongst women and that's been the death rate amongst men. So we see that men are dying more commonly than women from the data we have so far. And that is supported by the UK uh, intensive care audit data. Now, this one is particularly interesting. Body mass index. Now, body mass index, if you go onto the NHS website, you can calculate your own body mass index. It's a, basically, it's a, it's a degree of how overweight you are. And basically, the cutoff is about here. BMI is of over 25. So what we could say is that 25 to 30 are moderately overweight. BMIs of 30 to 40 are obese. And BMIs of over 40 are morbidly obese. So the first thing that we noticed is that patients that had a very low body mass index, only 0.6 of those needed intensive care. In, well, no, sorry, 0, 0.6 of the sample that were admitted to intensive care, 0.6 of the 196 were of a very low body weight. Indicating low body weight is associated 
with not getting the severe disease. Now, ordinary weight, you could say 18 to uh, 25 is kind of normal weight. So that's normal weight. So 27.7%. Uh, so basically 28% uh, were not overweight. But altogether, 71.7% of those needing intensive care were overweight, either overweight, obese or morbidly obese. So very interesting finding. So obesity here is correlated with increasing severity and the requirement for intensive care in COVID-19 infection. Now, this doesn't mean to say it's the obesity that's causing it, not by any means, because obesity is also associated with cardiovascular disease. It's associated with diabetes. And people that are obese often find it more difficult to breathe anyway, because for the diaphragm to go down, the diaphragm to go down for them to breathe in, they've got to displace more uh, abdominal fat if they have abdominal obesity, for example. So breathing difficulties are well known to present in people with obesity. But nonetheless, that's interesting. And from this information, I would be happy to advise you to lose weight if you are overweight, obese or morbidly obese. Now, um, looking at the dependency of people. So um, people that were independent, that had an independent lifestyle that could just knock around and look after their own activities of daily living. That was most patients. So most patients were able to look after themselves before admission. Um, only 12.9% uh, required help with the activities of daily living. So previous mobility there doesn't seem to be a massive factor. Although th 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 this is sort of minimal, really. Um, people that need some help, um, uh, they need some help with activities of daily living, such as washing and dressing. So all this means if they're independent is they can wash and dress themselves. It doesn't mean, say, they're out jogging or anything like that. Now, uh, severe comorbidities. Now, what they looked at here was people that had comorbidities. And uh, this is interesting. So they looked at people with cardiovascular disease, pre-existing right, respiratory disease, pre-existing renal kidney disease, pre-existing liver disease, metastatic disease. That means cancer that is spread. And metastasis is a cancer that's spread. Hematological malignancies and people that are immunocompromised. Now, the bar here was fairly high, to be fair. So the cardiovascular were people that had symptoms at rest, which is quite severe cardiovascular disease. The respiratory was people with shortness of breath, with light or, or um, mo moderate activity. So uh, again, quite bad respiratory disease. This was people that needed uh, dialysis or end-stage renal failure. The liver was people with cirrhosis or um, severe liver disease. The metastatic disease was distant metastases, in other words, people with advanced cancer. The hematological, hematological malignancies were acute or chronic leukaemia, multiple myeloma or lymphoma, all very serious medical conditions. And the immunocompromised was things like radiotherapy, chemotherapy and, and, and HIV. So these are actually quite a high bar, really, to qualify as having as having those. So someone, for example, with mild angina, when they went uh, exercising, wouldn't, wouldn't qualify for that. But still interesting to look at. So, um, and it's a limited sample. It's only 196 patients, so we can't take too much from it. But we know it's definitive data because it's from ICNARC. This is, this is immaculate data. So um, 1.6 of the total admissions had respiratory problems. 2.1 had renal problems. Uh, one point one had cancer, blood, blood and hematological cancers, and immunocompromised three point seven. So from that we can see that immunocompromised is a risk. So this is people taking steroids, people who've had organ transplants, people with HIV, people on other immunosuppressing therapies for such things as autoimmune disease are going to be at higher risk. That seems clear from that. And interesting people with pre-existing Renal disease seemed to be more at risk as well. And, and the respiratory risk factor was only the third. So that's, that's quite interesting, really. So, um, again, we can't take massive amounts from it. And, and the bar was fairly high. 
So uh, we'll, we'll look forward to more ICNARC data on that. And that's based on data for the first 24 hours following admission to the critical care unit. So the thing that I found particularly interesting was this uh, correlation with being overweight or obese. So over 70% of these patients were overweight or obese. Interesting data from the UK. We look forward to more coming. So um, quick message from this video. If you lose your sense of smell, consider that you may have the infection. It can be the presenting uh, feature. Um, you can't change your sex, but you can change your body mass index. So try and lose some weight and uh, optimize any medical treatments that you are on at the moment. But this just gives us some more indication on who we can expect to develop more severe disease. Although, as we've said, uh, we've been caught by surprise, uh, a few cases I actually know of, where young adults have been um, uh, taken a, a severe form of COVID-19, which wasn't anticipated. But thankfully, the, the, uh, the cases that are hard to explain are in the minority and the cases where we have these already identified risk factors and others we looked at yesterday when we looked at death rate um, gives us some indication of those that are higher risk. And of course, the government of the NHS have recently written to all people or are writing to all people who they consider to be at higher risk, over one and a half million people and advising them to completely uh, self-isolate at home, getting other people to do their shopping and all sorts of things like that. So they're able to uh, avoid coming into contact with the COVID-19 coronavirus in the first place.